Now, Republican State Senator Becky Harris is worried they could someday end up in humans. The ACLU says there is no urgent need to protect humans, but they agree the technology would violate privacy rights and raise serious concerns. I'm from Washington. John, always good to see you. Great to be with you. All right, we heard Chief of Staff Ryan's previous defend the president's declaration that the press is the enemy. Is this now part of their strategy? Well, it's kind of always been part of Donald Trump's strategy. He used it very well in the uh, campaign. Uh, this is a little bit something new. I mean, the idea is to have an opponent. Uh, he no longer has a, uh, a campaign opponent. So the press is very is useful. The press helps him do that uh, at times by uh, uh, writing stories that then have to be retracted. It's certainly something that thrills his supporters. Uh, so, yes, this is a part of the White House strategy. It's not new for administrations. This has certainly happened in history before. Uh, but when the president uh, uses the language he did, that is, uh, that is something that's new. John, as the president and many of his staff continue to blame the media, how long can this administration survive with this adversarial relationship? Well, they can survive quite a while. Uh, it, it's um, the challenges to an administration will really come from the surprise thing that will happen coming coming from overseas and and if the president can handle it uh, so far he's uh, the president has done a lot uh, he's done a lot to uh, both give concern and uh, and a lot of uh, hope to his supporters on capitol hill uh, on the big things uh, they think he's got he's moving in the right direction and if he follows through on the affordable care act on on uh, on tax re reform and on regulations, he'll be uh, more productive than they could have ever hoped for. So um, it's really a question of what happens in reality, not so much this battle with the press. Priebus repeatedly asked you to look at the president's accomplishments. One month in, how do the early days of the Trump presidency sort of stack up to the other administrations? Well, it's been uh, fast moving, chaos inviting. Uh, some of the chaos is by design. Some of the chaos has thwarted the president's own hopes, and specifically with respect uh, to his executive order on immigration. Uh, so he has moved fast, but uh, there's been a little bit of a raggedness to it that has worried some of his allies on, on Capitol Hill. But uh, and, and within the administration. But he's also uh, gotten some big things right. As I mentioned, the Supreme Court, uh, some of his other cabinet picks thrill uh, Republicans, his support for the, the Keystone Pipeline also. And then, uh, of course, what he's planning to do going forward, which will be a tough task, those three things I mentioned, health care regulations and, and taxes. But um, he's committed to them. Uh, and so on the big things, he's, um, he's moving in the direction he wants. And the uh, the, the, the difficulties he's had are, um, you know, he'll still have to work those out, but it's not all chaos and it's not uh, the finely tuned machine he suggests. Mm -hmm. Are you going to include the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Well, Hispanic I would. Caucus, I tell you what, do you want to well set up the, the meeting? Do you want to set up the meeting? No, no, no. I, are they I, friends I'm, of I'm yours? Just a no, get a, set up the I meeting. Know it seems President Donald Trump will finally sit down for a meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus and U.S. Representative Elijah Cummings. I actually thought I had a meeting with Congressman. Cummings and he was all excited and then he said oh I can't move it might be bad for me politically I can't have that meeting. Cummings said he canceled his meeting because he wanted to finalize a plan to bring down prescription drug prices first. The Congressional Black Caucus responded to Trump on Twitter pointing out they requested a meeting in January but never heard back. They wanted to discuss issues affecting African-American communities. On Sunday, Cummings said both he and the CBC had plans to meet with Trump. I want to talk about prescription drugs, the high price of prescription drugs. Uh, and he has made it clear that he wants to do something about that. I'm also going to John, I've got to talk to him about voting rights. It's not clear when the president will meet with the Black Caucus. Former U.S. officials say Israel's uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu turned down a regional peace initiative last year that was brokered by then American State uh, Secretary of State, that is, John Kerry. Now, officials who spoke on condition of anonymity said the secret summit was held in Jordan and included Jordan's King Abdullah, the second and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. And during that meeting, Kerry proposed regional recognition of Israel as a Jewish state alongside a renewal of peace talks with Palestinians with the support of the Arab countries. Netanyahu rejected the offer, which would have required a significant pullout from occupied land, saying that he will not be able to garner enough support for it in his hardline coalition government. Rejection of the offer was an apparent contradiction to Netanyahu's stated goal of involving regional Arab powers in resolving Israel's conflict. Hello and welcome to ILTV's Evening Update. I'm Aaron Porras here with the latest news from Israel. 
Israeli Navy boats fired warning shots at Palestinian fishermen yesterday after they deviated from permitted fishing zones in the Sudania area north of Gaza. The boat turned back after the warning salvo, and there were no reports of casualties. Israel allows Gazan fishermen to sail across six nautical miles, sometimes extending the zone to nine. Israel and Egypt maintain a security blockade on the Gaza Strip in order to prevent the terrorist group Hamas from importing more weaponry. Hamas has fired thousands of rockets into Israel, has dug attack tunnels into Israel, and waged three wars against the Jewish state. The Israeli branch of the Swedish furniture giant IKEA has apologized for issuing a catalog aimed at ultra-Orthodox customers containing no images of women, in keeping with the community's standards of modesty. The catalog was the first such attempt to reach out to the Haredi community, which makes up around 10% of Israel's population. The male-only catalog featuring Haredi models was published in addition to the regular brochure. Reactions to the catalog included confusion and sarcasm. A statement issued by a spokeswoman for IKEA in Sweden said that their brand stands for equal rights and that the publication from IKEA Israel does not live up to this. IKEA has nearly 400 stores in 48 countries worldwide, including three branches in Israel, and is planning to open two more in the next few years. Over 6,000 students in the Bedouin town of Segev Shalom boycotted class today in protest over the growing phenomenon of violence against teachers in the community. An incident on Thursday triggered the student strike when a teacher in the town was attacked by relatives of a student the teacher had removed from the classroom. The attackers waited for the teacher outside of the school, where he was badly beaten and taken to the Soroka Hospital in Be'er Sheva, covered in bruises. Police were called to the school but took no action against the attackers and left as soon as they were dispersed. Police are now investigating the attack. The head of the parents' committee called for security guards to be placed outside of schools to prevent further violence. An education ministry spokesperson said that it treats any case of violence in schools with the utmost seriousness and is taking action against the problem. In what has become an alarming trend on campuses across North America and Europe, growing anti-Semitism in the UK has raised great concern over the increased rate of incidents. Jewish students and academic activists are demanding from university administrations to do more to fight against the rising tide. Over the past few weeks, there have been Holocaust denial leaflets left around, stickers and swastikas etched into campus property, and even a swastika with the words Rights for Whites had been put up on a door in the residence hall at Exeter University. All these incidents were just in the last few weeks at British universities. While some Jewish university organizations deny the allegations, former senior proctor at Oxford University, Baroness Deitch, has alleged that amongst Jewish students, there is gradually a feeling that there are certain universities that you should avoid. Indeed, a report compiled by the Community Security Trust Group shows that anti-Semitic attacks targeting either students or staff and professors on universities had doubled in 2016 from 2015. Though the universities have issued statements condemning in broad terms all racist or discriminatory behavior as unacceptable, whistleblowers are asking that more be done and soon. According to Dietsch, in the 1920s and 30s, discrimination against Jews started in German, Austrian, and Polish universities, long before the Second World War. Attacks on Jewish students in universities today should be seen as the canary in the coal mine. It starts there and it spreads. A Palestinian man was arrested Saturday night for the production and sale of counterfeit Israeli entry permits to other Palestinians. According to the police report, the 31-year-old from Hebron in the West Bank was making nearly $550 per month in sales. The arrested man was caught at the summit of a two-month investigation, which began as an inquiry into fake permits found while Palestinians tried to enter the checkpoints near Jerusalem. The suspect even supposedly gave customers tips on how to avoid suspicion at the checkpoints. Over 50,000 Palestinians are thought to enter Israel illegally daily, primarily for work but this is already the second case of illegal border crossing to be reported in just 10 days. Earlier this month, five soldiers were arrested for taking bribes by Palestinians in the form of drugs and money in return for allowing them illegal entry. I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the American shift on a two-state solution draws mixed reactions in the Middle East. 
The White House's shift away from demanding a two-state solution is garnering a great deal of support from right-wingers in the Jewish state. Yet it's also been drawing fire from Ramallah. Many of Israel's nationalist politicians, such as Deputy Foreign Minister Tsipi Chotoveli, are embracing the change in tone from the White House. The Likud party says that after years of deadlock, Trump's statement that he isn't insisting on a two-state solution opens a wide range of opportunities to the entire region. Israeli residents of the Efrat settlement in the West Bank are also voicing their content over Trump's stance. It's just a good idea to start thinking beyond the two-state for two-state for two-people solution and find another sort of common way that we could find peace between the two people. Well, I think Trump is a businessman and uh, what he presented to, be the, to Bibi is either one of two options, either one state or two states. Anyway, as he said, Israel will have to pay something for it. And finally, if you ask me, there would be a Palestinian state uh, and, an, and an Israeli state. Israeli opposition lawmaker and former foreign minister Tsipi Livni is taking a more cautious approach. Thinking outside of the box is good. And as President uh, Trump said, it's decision of both sides, Israel and the Palestinians. I do believe that two states for two peoples is the right solution because it gives an answer to the national aspiration of two different peoples. The Palestinian Authority, however, is responding with alarm. PA President Mahmoud Abbas has reiterated his commitment to a two-state solution and continues to demand a halt to all Israeli settlement expansion. And here's what Chief Palestinian Negotiator Saeb Erekat had to say. So undermining the two-state solution will spell disaster on Palestinians and Israelis, and that's the truth. We're talking about peace in the region. We're talking about defeating extremists and, and, and terrorism in the region. And you cannot do that by merely waging wars. We need to get our act together. We need to have peace between Palestinians and Israelis. Now, as Palestinians, our option is international legality, is international law, is to live and let live, is to have the state of Palestine live side by side the state of Israel in peace and security on the 1967 lines. Meanwhile, in the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, Palestinians are expressing resignation and pessimism over the reaching of a peace accord with Israel anytime soon. لكن انا بقول بعتقد انه في الواقع لم يغير اي شيء اللقاء هو نفس حديثه عن المستوطنات حديثه عن الدولتين دوله دولتين حتى صرح وقال لك انا مش خلاف عندي لا دوله ولا دولتين المهم يتفاهم الطرفين وهذا يعني بعتقد انه لغى الحل السلمي نهائي في الضفه وغزه راح رئيس واجى رئيس يعني يجي احسن منه والله ما ظني شعبنا هو الغلبان U.S. President Donald Trump's decision to move away from the U.S.'s historical unwavering support of a two-state solution has stunned much of the international community, which has long crafted its diplomacy based on the premise of a future Palestinian state. Yet America's ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, is doing what she can to calm the shock by insisting that Washington remains committed to the two-state solution. The U.S. diplomat is nevertheless being careful to echo the president's statements that while he's open to finding new ways to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinians, a peace deal is not for Washington to impose, but can only come from the parties themselves. Well, I think, first of all, two-state solution is what we support. Let's, I mean, anybody that wants to say the United States doesn't support two-state solution, um, that would be an error. We absolutely support a two-state solution. But we are thinking out of the box as well, which is, what does it take to bring these two sides to the table? What do we need to have them agree on? At the end of the day, the solution to what will bring peace in the Middle East is going to come from the Israelis and the Palestinian Authority. The United States is just there to support the process. Haley then blasted the General Assembly and the Security Council for being focused on criticizing Israel while stressing the Jewish state is the one true democracy in the Middle East. The ambassador says the U.S. will never let another anti-settlement resolution like 2331 pass, as the Obama administration did in December, which condemned settlement building. Haley went on to underscore Washington's determination to fight anti-Israel bias at the U.N.